We're going to look at the wide-ranging topic of education in Florida, including what's happening in the state legislature. And joining us by Zoom to talk about this is Andrew Sparr, the president of the Florida Education Association. FEA is the statewide teachers union. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming on. So let's begin by having you tell us more about your organization. What is the FEA? Sure, the Florida Education Association is the uh, largest uh, union in the state of Florida. We represent uh, about 120,000 teachers, uh, support staff in our public schools, as well as professors and graduate assistants at Florida, all of Florida's universities and many of our colleges. After the State of the State address, the FEA released a criticism of the direction of education in Florida. So I want to ask you about some of the things that you brought up in that email. You say, Parents, students, and educators felt left out of the conversation on education in Florida. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what we've been seeing happen over the last 25 years, really, in the state of Florida is a lot of regulation, over-regulation. Um, and it started back with what was called the A-plus plan, a legislative package under then-Governor Jeb Bush. Uh, and it's continued to this day, where every year, there are more rules and laws put in place that dictate from Tallahassee what local schools and, and uh, what local communities need to be doing as it relates to our, our public schools and the education of our children. And we believe that the best place to make decisions about the education of a student is between the parent and the teacher working together with the administration and the school team to make sure that every child is successful. A recent FEA poll found that 55% of voters feel public education in Florida is on the wrong track, while only 26% believe schools are on the right track. What do you make of those findings? Well, I think when you look at the rest of our poll, what it shows is that people aren't buying this idea of limiting curriculum, banning books, uh, making it very difficult for teachers to do their jobs. What our polls show is that Parents want a lot more advanced placement classes, something the governor has limited. Uh, they want the ability for students to participate in a wide variety of career and tech programs. Uh, and they want their children to have the opportunity to participate in music, art, and physical education, as well as other electives. And so when parents see those opportunities being limited and they see uh, other people, uh, sometimes without even kids in the school system, dictating what should be allowed in school, uh, it gets very frustrating. And I think because of that, voters realize in the state of Florida that uh, we're not heading in the right direction. We need to support our public schools. Uh, people see that we rank 43rd in the nation in funding for our schools. We rank 48th in the nation in average teacher pay. That's not something to brag about by any stretch of the imagination. And voters get it. And it's time that the governor and lawmakers listen to them. You've said that there is an exodus of teachers from the state and also from the teaching profession itself. And the, the way you put it is because of politics that puts students last. So give us an idea of the teacher shortage in Florida and how that might be fixed. Yeah, I'm going to give you a personal story on the teacher shortage. I have two daughters. One's in college now. One it just started ninth grade. And at the beginning of this school year, my daughter did not have an English teacher. In fact, for the first nine weeks of the school year, my daughter did not have an English teacher. And this is the third year in a row that she was missing a teacher at some, uh, in some class uh, at some point during the year. My daughter is not alone. We have a really bad teacher and staff shortage in the state of Florida, uh, and it's driven largely by pay and pay policies, unfair pay, low pay, uh, and it's driven by the politics and being infused into our classrooms that is getting in the way of teachers being able to do their jobs. When you talk to teachers and staff at any public school, uh, they will tell you they just want to be able to do their job. Our guest is Andrew Sparr, the president of the Florida Education Association. FEA is the statewide teachers union. We're talking about education issues in Florida and the Florida legislature. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And you've pointed out that in 2023, Florida led the nation in book bans. Why is that a problem for education? Look, what every teacher uh, knows, and I believe what every parent realizes as well, is that we want kids to be excited about reading. And in order to be excited about reading, they need to have books that they relate to, books that excite them, that have topics that interest them. 
and they need to have books in which they see themselves in. And when you look at all of the book banning that's been going on across the state of Florida, one, it's important to recognize that many of the books being pulled off shelves are being pulled off the shelves by the request of people who don't even have kids in the public schools. I can't underscore that enough that people who have no kids in the public schools are the ones asking for the most books to be banned from our schools. Um, second of all, uh, when you look at the books that are being banned, they are books uh, about students uh, who may have come to this country or their families may have come through from to this country from other countries. They are books about the African-American experience in the United States, and they are books about the LGBTQ plus community. And so when you see those specific types of books being banned, it really sends a message to kids uh, who may be part of any of those communities I just mentioned uh, that they are not important. And that is devastating to kids, that hampers their learning, uh, and that prevents them from being able to truly get excited and invested in reading, which at the end of the day, we all know is so vital to their success. One example in Florida of book banning is that a federal judge ruled recently that a lawsuit against a school, school district in the Panhandle can move forward Free speech advocates have sued Escambia County School District and its board, school board for violating the First Amendment by removing 10 books. What about this case in Escambia County? Uh, why do you think that uh, this is, you know, is, is this one of the, um, I don't know, is, is this a, an example kind of, of of what's happening with these book bans here in Florida? Yeah, I think you're seeing uh, parents pushing back because it's their kids that are being shortchanged. And I, if I understand that case correctly, it's not one we're directly involved in, in in Escambia County. And so if I understand correctly, it's from parents who are concerned that their child is not able to get access to books that the parents would like them to be able to read. You know, keep in mind that parents in Florida have always had a tremendous amount of say in their child's education. If at any time in Florida, this has always been the case for as long as I've been teaching, and this is my 30th year in schools in Florida. Um, and, and, but it's always been the case that if a parent has a concern with a book or a project or an assignment, the parent can ask for their child to be uh, exempted from that book, that project, that assignment, and get an alternative in its place. Uh, that has always been the case. That always ha has happened if that was necessary in Florida. What we're seeing now, again, are parents in some cases who are trying to keep other kids from reading books they don't want their child to read, or again, worse yet in my mind, is people who have no kids in the public school system saying that kids shouldn't be able to read certain books. Uh, teachers, go out of their way to make sure that they have books that excite kids with reading. Uh, most of the books in a teacher's classroom are books they have purchased themselves very often with a specific student in mind. You've pointed out that students of color in Florida are being shortchanged because of how standards are taught. What do you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, again, we saw this governor ban advanced placement uh, course for uh, African-American studies here in Florida. It was actually being in, piloted in a high school in Miami. That should be something we wear as a as a, an honor in the state of Florida that the advanced placement, the who runs advanced placement courses, uh, was piloting a test in a limited number of schools. And one of those schools was a high school in Miami. The governor stopped that course middle of the year, sent kids to other classes, deprived them of that experience and that learning, and now will not let any student in Florida uh, take an advanced placement class uh, in uh, African-American studies if uh, that class is being, uh, if their kid is in a public school, that is. Um, private schools and other groups can offer that class, just not the public schools. And, uh, and so this really does, I think, again, send a message that students are not getting a complete and honest history. Uh, students of color in particular are not uh, being able to see themselves in their learning and have a better understanding about what is happening and has happened uh, in the history of this country as it relates to uh, minorities. And, uh, and so it is, it is a great disservice to our students. The FEA has put forward a list of about a dozen ideas that you want to be implemented by the Florida State Legislature. And so I want to find out more about a couple of these. 
For example, you're asking for funding for full day pre-K programs in opportunity zones of high poverty. Why is that important? Well, we know that so many kids come into kindergarten not prepared to learn. And almost always kids who come in unprepared to learn are kids who come from families who live in poverty. And in a lot of cases, extreme poverty. And we know that poverty is the number one indicator as to whether or not a student is going to be successful in school. And we wanna disrupt that system. And we believe one of the fastest ways to disrupt that system is to have full day pre-K with certified teachers uh, and small classes so that students are truly getting the basic skill sets they need, letters uh, and numbers, sounds, uh, shapes, colors, uh, and the basic skill sets they need to have foundational, um, uh, to have a foundational platform for which to build for reading and math. Is, is pre-K that important? Is it, is how important it is, is it, I guess I would ask, how is it, how important is it to, uh, for people to, for children to start learning early, and how does that translate into success later in, in grades? Well, there, there's been a lot of research done that if students aren't reading on grade level by the third grade, they're more likely to um, drop out of school. And that's not what any of us want. We know that kids who finish with a high school education uh, earn more than those who don't. Uh, those who go on to college or or trade school, uh, earn more than those who just have a high school degree, and so on. And so if we truly want to break the cycle of poverty, we need to make sure that we're investing and investing early. Uh, you know, I taught at a school uh, in Daytona Beach that was a high poverty school. 98% of the students received free or reduced lunch, uh, meaning they lived in poverty. And um, what we saw was a large percentage of students coming in, not knowing their letters, their numbers, their shapes, their, their um, vowel sounds or consonant sounds, uh, the basic skill sets they need to be successful. And we also know that kids who live in poverty are more likely to have parents who are working uh, two and three jobs and therefore don't always have a parent at home on a regular basis to read to them, to encourage them and to support them. Um, and so we really want to break that cycle of poverty and it's not gonna happen if we don't disrupt the system. One of the other ideas that the FEA has put forward is that you would like statutes revised in Florida regarding required local effort to maintain current taxation rates. So what would that do? Again, what, what we worry about uh, is this constant rollback of the local required effort. Our schools are willfully underfunded and, uh, and our schools are funded by two sources. They're funded by property taxes and they're funded by uh, the state sales tax uh, that comes back down to our schools through state funding. And, uh, and so when you look at what's happening uh, in our schools right now in terms of funding, Florida ranks 43rd in the nation. And we're one of the wealthiest states in the nation. And so we really believe that we have to make sure that there are funds available for our schools uh, so that we can, and what we've called on the legislature to do quite honestly is increase funding by two and a half billion dollars a year over the next seven years. By doing that, we will move from 43rd in the nation in funding to top 10 in the nation in funding. We will move from 48th in teacher pay to top 10 in the nation in teacher pay. We will be able to deal with mental health supports by hiring more school counselors, more school psychologists, more school social workers, and we will be able to deal with a lot of the academic challenges so many of our students face. That's what that kind of investment will do. It would be life-changing for students here in the state of Florida, and it will spur the economy to levels never seen before in the state of Florida as well. So is the Florida legislature budgeting enough for, for education in Florida? And what are the constitutional requirements in Florida for that? And where does the lottery money play in all of this? Yeah, so first of all, no, we are not funding our schools adequately here in the state of Florida and haven't for as long as I've been uh, working in schools here in the state of Florida. Florida, again, ranks 43rd in the nation in funding for our schools, and we are one of the wealthiest states in the nation. And in fact, if Florida was a world economy, we would be one of the wealthiest economies in the world. Uh, so it's, it's really uh, despicable that we do not do a better job funding our schools. The Florida Constitution makes it clear. It is the paramount duty of the state to make adequate provisions 
uh, for a free system of public schools in the state of the Flor in the state of Florida. And so uh, I believe the state fails in that provision uh, of the Constitution. There has been lawsuits on it in the past, and the courts have said it's too vague of an area to really enforce through the courts. It's a legislative prerogative. Um, so we really do need to uh, implore our state lawmakers and the governors to do a better job in funding our schools. Uh, and so that's what that's what we have to do. And I mentioned the, the lottery money a minute ago. Uh -huh. People always ask about that. Well, wait a second. We're rolling in lottery money. Why isn't that all funneling to education? Yeah, so uh, the lottery funds do come to our schools. They're used for specific sources, mostly for bright future scholars, which are, are scholarships for uh, students to go on to uh, the college or university level and, and get scholarships. Uh, ironically, bright futures, uh, we have more students qualifying for them than they can fund. So they've made it harder and harder for students to get those scholarships and they've limited uh, what those scholarships actually pay for. So, uh, so again, you have still an underfunding of schools and the lottery shouldn't be the end all and be all. And I think most of us do feel there was a little bait and switch there. There was a lottery funding that came in at the same time they reduced the overall budget of schools to, to essentially have that money supplant what was already going there. Our guest is Andrew Spar, the president of the Florida Education Association. FEA is the statewide teachers union. We're talking about education issues in Florida. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Another one of the ideas that the FEA put forward is to let experienced teachers earn multi-year contracts. How would that make a difference in education in Florida? So we used to have in Florida what they called continuing contract, which meant if a teacher was doing their job well, they knew they had a job year after year after year. Some people refer to it as tenure, but it really wasn't tenure. But it was, it was this idea that a teacher who was performing well would, would keep their job from year to year. They wouldn't be working at the whim of someone who decides, I don't like you anymore. You're now out of a job. Um, but that they actually have some stability. And it was important, I'm just going to say, because it allowed teachers to really stand up for students without the fear that if they stood up for the right of a student, that they could potentially lose their job. It does happen in schools in Florida where teachers are told you are not to say anything about a student getting what they deserve, because if you do, you will no longer be employed in this school. And that idea of continuing contract added that job security, knowing that teachers who advocate for students on a daily basis could do so without the fear of retaliation. That was taken away from teachers back in 2009. And so uh, what we have now is what they call annual contract, which essentially means a teacher gets a pink slip at the end of every year. And unless the district says, we're going to rehire you, they're out of a job. The district literally has to say, we're going to rehire you in order to keep them employed. And so what a multi-year contract would do is give some stability to teachers so they know that if they're doing their job, they're gonna have their job for uh, multiple years. We're right now asking for a three-year multi-year contract. So in other words, if a teacher is doing their job and performing well, they would have a three-year contract. If they continue to do well, they get another three-year contract and so on, uh, which is I think important to one, stability, and two, what it's also going to do is it's going to make sure uh, that we keep teachers in the profession. When the parental rights and education bill was being debated in the Florida legislature, opponents called it don't say gay. There were uh, people who said, well, the bill will do this. It won't do that. What can you tell us about how it's being implemented in schools and, and what are what are you hearing from some of the teachers and some of the, the students about how that bill is being how that law is being Im implemented? Well, you, you talked about the lawsuit in Escambia County. Uh, in Escambia County now, I think it's 1,200 books, including dictionaries that have been removed and, and they're citing the law, the parental rights law, um, as their uh, reason because it talks about there may be a definition of sex in the dictionary and therefore you can't have it in the schools. I think it's gotten way out of hand. And uh, I think what uh, most people already knew is we, do, we did not... Uh, talk about uh, sex and gender identity and, and stuff like that in elementary school. We never did. There was a program in fifth grade in a lot of districts. Many of them refer to it as different names. One name was used was changes, for example, and it talked about uh, two kids, boys in one group, girls in another group about their changing bodies and what that meant 
Um, and so uh, those classes parents had to sign if they didn't want that, you know, would, would uh, could opt their kids out. They were notified and they could opt their kids out of that class if they so wanted to. Um, so this was really a false flag that lawmakers pushed forward and the governor in particular. Uh, it was a political uh, opportunity as far as I'm concerned for his campaign. Uh, and it created a lot of and continues to create a lot of havoc in our schools, again, specifically targeting uh, students who may be part of the LGBTQ community or may have family members who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Let's talk now about private school vouchers. Many Florida, the Florida legislature expanded private school vouchers and many Florida families still have not received those vouchers that were promised to them after House Bill 1 was signed into law last year. Um, what are your thoughts about the expansion, how that's been going, and um, and maybe vouchers in general? Uh, so again, we've had vouchers in Florida for over 20 years, I think, at this point. And, uh, you know, you look at uh, where students and parents continue to send their students is the public schools. And so what was very concerning about House Bill 1 last year uh, was that this now opened the door to universal vouchers and kids who are already in private schools who come very often from affluent families who have a lot of resources, all of a sudden now are getting vouchers. And that's what has panned out. I think even the data that the organization who runs vouchers put out, uh, it looks like about 85% or so of those dollars, about 1.1 billion new dollars, uh, went to families with their kids already in private school who have the means to uh, pay for private school. But almost 90% of kids in the state of Florida attend our public schools. And so those were dollars that were diverted away uh, from our public schools. And uh, again, without a fair playing field. I mean, there's literally practically zero accountability for voucher schools. Uh, and yet our public schools, we have a book that's pages, you know, uh, I don't remember the number of pages, a thousand, over a thousand pages thick of laws and rules that that school districts must follow. Um, so it is an unlevel playing field. There is no accountability for taxpayer dollars when it goes out the door uh, to vouchers. And uh, again, uh, our public schools are getting shortchanged. Earlier in the interview, you talked about regulation of schools and that being a burden to schools. And the Florida legislature is con concentrating on deregulation of public schools. And I want to find out if when, you, when they say deregulation and when you say deregulation, if we're talking about the same thing, it's a priority of Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo. There's a bill called SB 7004. It would remove requirements that high school students pass Florida's 10th grade English language arts exam in order to graduate Instead, that would be 30% of a student's final course grade. It also remo removes passing the Algebra One final exam to get a diploma. These are a couple of things that that bill would do, this deregulation of public schools. What are your thoughts about Kathleen Pasadomo's priorities here? Well, I appreciate the Senate president taking in a, a stab at this. Uh, when we look at, there's actually three bills in that package, uh, Senate Bill 7000, 7002, and 7004. Um, and when we look at those bills, there are some good things in there. You just mentioned uh, some of the changes in, in terms of how uh, students are set up for graduation and what high stakes tests mean. And in this case, lowering some of those stakes. Uh, you, you may hear the, the Speaker of the House say, uh, well, we're not in favor of that because they're not in the House because they feel that's eliminating some accountability. There's always been accountability in our schools and in our public schools specifically uh, because teachers issue tests, they have projects, they give grades, they give quarterly grades. Um, and what research has shown is those are the most accurate assessments of how well kids are doing, not a high stakes standardized test uh, de developed by some company that the state is paying millions of dollars to. Uh, it's also interesting, again, that they talk about we have to have accountability unless you're giving the money to private schools, in which case you don't need to have any. Um, so it is this double standard. If it's about the education of kids, let's do what's best for kids, uh, which is making sure we're supporting them. And as far as these bills being deregulation, all three of them, some of them do. Some of them literally wipe out some of the rules that are in place. Uh, and we support that. Some of them are rewriting the rules to reduce the regulation in place. Uh, for example, third grade retention, the rules in the Senate would be rewritten to really focus and give more intervention and progress monitoring in kindergarten, first and second grade, which is where we should do it, not 
third grade. Um, and so, uh, so that's a, a step in the right direction, but there's also more regulation being added in this legislation. So it's not truly a deregulation bill where you would be removing stuff they're actually adding regulation to. And this has been the trend for 25 years in the state of Florida as it relates to public schools, add more laws, add more rules, more red tape that gets in the way of doing what is best for kids and has Tallahassee bureaucrats making the decisions rather than the parents, teachers, and administrators at the school level. I want to turn now to another bill that doesn't directly uh, apply to education per se, but I'm hearing teachers speak out about speak out against it. And I've heard your organization oppose it as well. It's called HB 49. It's a bill that would weaken child labor protections for 16 year olds and 17 year olds. Tell us about that bill and why the FEA opposes it. Yeah, for us, it's very straightforward. We believe in education and, uh, and kids should be in school and that should be their number one priority. We also recognize the reality that so many of our kids in Florida live in poverty, and there is an expectation and a need for them to be working. Uh, but what we've had in place for a, quite a while right now, and look, as unions, we have we have stood strong in the need for child labor laws. There was a time in the United States of America, there were no child labor laws, and rolling back time uh, to eliminate those child labor laws is just the wrong thing, period, full stop. What we should be doing is making sure that kids are able to get the education they deserve and need, which means they have to uh, have reasonable restrictions in place such as we have now, where kids can't work, I believe, past 10 p.m. so that they on a school night so that they can go home, finish homework, get a good night's sleep and be ready for school the next morning, allowing kids to any hour of the night, allowing a boss to say, if you don't stay, um, you know, we're going to fire you. And they have to make a decision about whether they're able to go home and study for an important exam tomorrow, which is going to determine their fate, because that's what we do, high stakes exams in Florida, or work until 12 or one o'clock in the morning and not be ready for that test is not fair to students. And so we should have those rules in place that show that the state of Florida values the education of children and allowing children to be children uh, is so vitally important. Right now, the the limit on the number of hours that a student could work during school is 30 hours a week. And there's also a requirement that minors get 30 minute breaks every four hours when they're working. But these those two uh, qualifications will be eliminated if this bill passes. One thing that has been changed recently in the bill is that the bill now does not include allowing students to work overnight shifts, even when the, when there's school the next day. That was taken out of the bill. Um, how, why would it be? Why would working for more than thirty hours during a a, a week during a school? How would that impact a child's ability to learn? Look, I think if we talk to most people who, who are adults who are working, they're working 40 hours, maybe 45, maybe 50 hours, depending on what they do. You're talking about a kid who's in school for 35 hours a week or more, uh, especially if they're involved in other activities, and then saying they should be able to work for more than 30 hours a week outside that day. So between their school and the work, they could be having 70, 80 hours. Is that really how we want students uh, focusing uh and, and growing up, uh, number one. Number two, uh, in addition to being in school, there's homework, there's studying that has to be done. And if they're working all hours of the day and night uh, to uh, instead of being able to focus on their child's, uh, instead of focusing on their studies, uh, of course, that could disadvantage them in the long term. And so we value public education, we value education. Uh, and so I think it's really important that we have reasonable rules in place. And even 30 hours a week is a fair amount of time. Taking that away and saying they could work more, 40, 50 hours a week or, or more is not a good idea. Uh, and again, I'll say, like I said earlier, yeah, the bill says that they can't work overnight shifts, but they can work till midnight. And again, uh, you're talking about some kids who have to be in school at eight o'clock the next morning. Uh, last year, the legislature passed a bill saying don't start school too early because kids need their sleep. And now they're saying, but let them work till midnight. By the time they get off work at midnight, get home, get showered and ready for bed. If they have homework to do, do their homework. We're saying they're not going to bed till two or three in the morning. 
how is that good for for kids and how is that going to ensure their success in the future? The bill's sponsor, Linda Cheney, a Republican from St. Pete Beach, said, these are youth workers that are driving auto automobiles. They are not children. Do you have any thoughts on, on that comment by the bill's sponsor? Uh, we don't let 16 and 17 year, 17 year olds vote in the state of Florida. Um, and we certainly don't let them do a bunch of other things uh, that that uh, because they're not adults. And I think you're seeing more and more research. And even though we say an 18 year old is an adult, that most uh, people who who uh, deal with childhood psychology and the like say that the way the brain forms and the decisions that people make isn't really solidified till they're 23 or older. Uh, so this idea that um, it's okay to put uh, young people to work for for in ornament um, in an ornament an um, inordinate amount of hours is just uh, ridiculous. And uh, again, what I would say is um, you're talking about situations where kids can be put in situations where they are told you either stay or you get fired. And if they were supposed to be off, let's say at 10 o'clock, uh, so they could go home and study and prepare for a test and someone tells them you either stay or get fired and you have to work till 12 o'clock tonight, uh, they're being forced uh, into making a decision where they lose their income if that's helping them and their family or uh, they don't get the education they deserve and need. And that's not appropriate at all. Are there other bills in the Florida legislature that we should pay attention to when it comes to education? Well, once again, there's legislation that, again, is trying to make it harder for teachers and staff to come together and advocate for their profession and for their students through their union. Uh, so we're certainly watching those bills and trying to, again, make sure that teachers and staff have a voice. It is very, very important uh, that we have the ability to come together and advocate uh, without our union and without our ability to advocate through our union, uh, our public schools would be missing out on a lot because parents look towards up to us, uh, very often administrators and school board looks look to us to really raise questions and concerns when things aren't going right. And quite honestly, that's why we're the target of the governor and others who really want to take away the voice of educators uh, and to be able to do whatever they want in public schools. And as we wrap up, what else should people know about education in Florida and uh, about your organization? I would ask every listener to think back to their childhood. And when you think back to your childhood, you think about school. And when you think about school, you can really, uh, everyone can name a teacher, multiple teachers and staff who had a tremendous impact on them. For me, it was Mrs. Beck in kindergarten. It was Mr. Gatchy uh, in sixth grade and Mr. Black in fifth grade who taught me math. Mr. Black used to say, Andrew Sparr will go far in his brand new sports car. But he had a profound effect on me uh, when it came to math and excited me about math. It might be Dr. Goodwin who I had for reading in fifth and sixth grade who taught me, you don't have to know all the answers. You just need to know where to go to get the answers. Or it might be Mrs. Adams who I had in ninth and 12th grade uh, English, who really helped me grow in high school on my writing skill set. Uh, so there are so many uh, teachers who impacted me, who had a profound impact on me, on me and who I am today, and really excited me about going into the teaching profession. And so many of us can go through the same thing. We got to make sure kids today can do, say that too. And they can't if we keep tying the hands of teachers and limiting what they can do uh, if we keep getting in the way and allowing politics to get in the way of doing what is best for kids. Did you end up getting a sports car? I did not. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for joining us on Tuesday Cafe, Andrew. Thanks for having me, Sean. I have a great one. Thank you, too. Andrew Sparr is president of the Florida Education Association. FEA is the statewide teachers union. We've been speaking about the new session of the Florida legislature and education issues in the state. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa.